ambitious YouTube video to date. This is going to be my ultimate tarantula spiderling husbandry guide. I'm going to take you all the way from selecting the size of your tarantula to shopping online to buying it to setting up the enclosure and receiving and unpacking in this video. And we'll continue with feeding, hydration, how to keep it watered and moist, maintenance, temperatures, molting, and behaviors. So unfortunately, this was originally supposed to be one video, but it came out way too long. So I'm going to break it down into two. And then afterwards, I will probably combine the two for people that really want to sit down for a marathon viewing and watch all hour and whatever it's going to be of it. So this was inspired by my website where I did an article a while back on tarantula sling husbandry. And I had some people ask if I could demonstrate some of the things that I mentioned in the video. And I thought, hey, why not just do the whole husbandry guide as a video. So again, this portion will have what size to get, where to get your sling, enclosures, and receiving and unpacking. And for this video, we're going to assume you already picked a species so you can see my best beginner species video if you're still trying to select one. So here we go. So you've chosen the species you want to get. Now you're doing some shopping and you found that some places have them on sale, but they're teeny tiny. And here I have a picture of my first instar, which are about to be second instar, Hapalopus species, Columbia large slings, just to give you an idea of how tiny a second instar sling can be. Now these guys will obviously put on a little size when they molt, but having raised these guys from second instar before, they will start off very, very small. And I think some people look at when they're shopping the size of the sling and think, ah, what difference does it make? A sling is a sling. Well, yes and no. The fact of the matter is the smaller teeny tiny slings come with their own set of hassles. First off, they're a bit less hardy than their older, more established counterparts. So a one inch sling is generally gonna be a little stronger, a little tougher than a say eighth inch sling or fourth inch sling. And one thing that can't go underestimated, they can be very difficult to spot. I've had um, G. Polkrapes slings before that I couldn't even find in their enclosure and it was one of the small AMAC enclosures. So here we go, here's a little size comparison. I have the pencil down the bottom so you can see just how small a one, inch, one eighth inch sling can be or even a quarter inch sling. They're small, they're tiny. Um, one of the things you want to look at is your comfort level as far as slings are concerned and the species of the slings. For faster growing slings, starting off a little smaller won't matter that much. However, for the majority of slings, for somebody just starting out, I usually encourage three quarters of an inch or higher. Ideally, one inch, 1.25 inches is fine. That's a well-established sling, one that's likely to eat well and eat live prey, so we'll get into the feeding a little bit afterwards, and be a little tougher. One of the things about slings is they're missing the waxy coating that the adult counterparts have, which makes them much more prone to dehydration. So the larger they get, the less prone they're going to be to um, I become very dehydrated from lack of water and sometimes it happens you know everybody makes mistakes so you want something that's kind of well established so try to pick one that's over three quarters of an inch I'm not really you know regardless of how cheap it may be and here's my little G Rosea the reason I'm showing her is right now she's about one and a quarter inches when I picked her up it was about almost four years ago and she was about a quarter of an inch so it's taken her that long to get that size so something to keep in mind is many of the beginner species that are popular are the slow growing Afonapelma, Gramostola, uh, Brachypelma, and Uaethla species that can take forever to grow. So people that are just getting into the hobby for, with beginners that pick up one of these little tiny slings, it's going to be a while before you have a big bad tarantula on your hands. And something to keep in mind, in the United States we use diagonal leg span or DLS which is measuring the tarantula diagonally from the tip of the first leg on one side to the tip of the fourth leg on the other side. Um, some places in Europe actually measure the length of the body, so you might want to double check on that if there are any questions. But generally in the U.S., it's DLS. And here we have my little auratum. Again, another example of a specimen that I got as a teeny tiny sling. After two and a half years, this little girl is now a whopping one inch. So again, just something to keep in mind when shopping for slings. You wanna pay attention to the size and try to start with something just a little bit larger if it's your first time raising one.
Okay, this wasn't originally part of the sling husbandry guide. However, I do think it's important to cover it. A lot of people, after they decide to buy a sling, are wondering where to buy one. And I generally steer people toward online vendors. I've had fantastic luck with them. That's where I buy all of mine from is online because they don't sell them in my state. And the truth is most pet stores, not all of them, but most don't know what they're doing as far as tarantulas are concerned. You'll find them kept in poor conditions. They will sell you a bunch of useless things like heat rocks and heat mats that could kill them and sponges to put in their water dishes that you don't need. And they give faulty advice as far as how to keep them. And I know because having done Tom's Big Spiders for a while, I get at least two or three emails a week asking to double check on some poor advice they got from a pet store. So I encourage people, especially when buying slings, to find a reputable breeder or dealer online and buy from them. Buying through the mail is easy, very, very easy, simple, safe, and the best way to make sure you get the tarantula that you really want. So starting off with my list of dealers is Fear Not Tarantulas. Tanya has been amazing to work with. I've bought from her several times and just easily one of the nicest people in the hobby. She breeds her own stuff, so she's incredibly knowledgeable about the species she's selling. And she also sells a huge selection of tarantulas, including beginner tarantulas, and she has her own beginner tarantula section, which is great for people that are new, and more advanced species and species that serious hobbies are, hobbyists are looking for. She also sells cages, and one of the things I want to point out is that their policy is they cover all deaths, including ones that may be caused by shipping. And this is huge, because if FedEx loses your package and your spider dies, many places will not pay the cost or refund the cost or replace the spider that was lost. She will, and that's a big thing, something to you know give people that are ordering from her a lot of confidence. But again, just an A-plus experience all around if you buy from Tanya. Next up is Jamie's Tarantulas. Again, she has a good selection. It's always changing. Prices are good. Has a really good shipping option with a lag, which a lot of people enjoy. And like Tanya also sells enclosures. So if you want to buy your tarantula in an enclosure at the same time and you don't feel like futzing with making your own or buying your own separately, very convenient. She also sells feeder insects. So you can pretty much have everything you need for your tarantula in one one stop, which is great. And she's fantastic to work with. She's responsive, polite, and has no problem helping beginners out. Netbug Anastasia has a lot of species in stock, especially a lot of females, which I know people are looking for, and she sexes them out early. My dealings with her have been fantastic, communicates very, very well, accommodating. She offered to meet me because we're in the same state when I had to ship something to save me the price of shipping, and just a great place to buy from. Everybody I've sent her away has been very pleased. Next is Pinchers and Pokies, which I believe is a husband and wife team. I've bought from them a couple times, and they've been fantastic. Just incredibly nice people, know their stuff, aim to please, respond to all emails like literally within an hour, which I found amazing. And they also carry scorpions and some other critters. So I definitely encourage people to check out their stock and see what they have if they're looking for slings or tarantulas. Next up is Ken the Bug Guy, ordered from Ken a lot. He's been in the hobby for many, many years, very respected, carries a, a good amount of stock, and is very good at communicating with emails. So again, somebody to look at if you're looking for a certain species. Next is Camel Spiders. I've ordered from Alfie before. He's a great guy. Has um, it's just been building up the business, and it's been kind of neat because I know a lot of my friends order from him as well. And he is on Facebook a lot, so anybody that wants to find him, he's very easy to get in touch with, loves talking about tarantulas, and somebody that carries a really good st uh, stock, so check him out. Swift's Invert, I'm embarrassed to say I have not purchased from Kelly Swift before. There's been many times I've been really close, and I haven't, but he has a stellar reputation in the hobby. Somebody I always point out to people without any reservations whatsoever, even though I haven't personally bought from him. He, he's been around for years, knows his stuff, breeds a lot of these species, works with a lot of breeders. So, again, one of the places that I haven't bought from personally, but I can say with, you know, Conviction is a great place to buy from if you're looking for tarantulas. And finally, a warning. No, do not order from these people. I'm not going to get into it, get long-winded about it. Just look up the real reviews from people. You can be sent the wrong species, the wrong uh, sex, 
um, mature mail, a, a litany of issues. Just don't order from this place. They also drop ship, which means they don't see your teas. And now let's hop across the pond to UK. So for the people, because I know there's a lot of people re reading these and watching the videos that don't live in the US, I asked my buddy Mark from Mark's Tarantulas to help me out with some places that he buys from because I trust his judgment. So first up, he gave me the Spider Shop. I have to admit, I love the layout of this website. It's just absolutely gorgeous. They have a great selection of teas. Prices look good. Definitely a place to check out. Next up is Tarantulas Bristol. Um, again, I love the layouts of these sites. Um, great selection of teas, look like good prices. And I've had these guys mentioned to me a couple times from dealer, from people that buy over in the UK. So they sound to have a great reputation. And Martin Gross, which is one I wouldn't have known about, so I'm glad he recommended it. Again, good selection, carries a lot of different inverts. And finally, Spider's World, which I believe is out of Poland, if I remember correctly. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, in the, in the comments. And have a beautiful selection of tarantulas and ship all over Europe. And this one coming up, if anybody has this in the U.S., please let me know. Orphanacus dichromatis. God, that's a gorgeous tea. I'm like really jealous. And next up, we have Canadians. For the Canadians, our buddies up north, a um, couple places to buy from. Not as many here. Tarantula Canada has been a big one for years. They carry a great selection. And going through their site, they have they have some really good prices. Like, I'm kind of jealous on some of them. I always find it interesting how the prices differ from different countries, between country to country. And Arachnophiliacs, funny story about them. When I first got into the hobby and was shopping online, I made a big list and emailed them. And the people were like, hey, we're so glad we, you like our stock and you like our prices. Unfortunately, we're in Canada. So, again, when you're shopping online, always check to see where they're coming from. You want to order from your own country. But they have a great list, uh, offer many different sizes and great prices. So there you go, just a little tutorial. If anybody wants to read more, again, I'll include another link to the original article about ordering uh, tarantulas safely online. But... Keep in mind, I've done this. I know people are afraid to. I've bought probably 95 to 98% of my tarantulas online. I've had exactly one issue total, and it was the person's fault. It was pretty much somebody shipping who shouldn't have been shipping. Long story there, but every other one that I bought from, from a major dealer has been a great experience. You get them overnight. Just keep in mind that shipping is going to cost some money, usually $35 to $50, but just factor it in with the price of the tea and try to find a lot of things you want. It's one of the reasons why I think people's collections grow so quick because they're trying to get the most for their shipping dollar, but highly recommended to buy online. Now that your tarantula is on the way, it's time to figure out what you're going to put it in. So I'm going to go over a couple of the more popular enclosure styles for slings, but to start off, I'm going to show you how to ventilate because I get a lot of questions about this. Easiest way to pick up one of these, which is a soldering iron. I picked this one up on Amazon, I believe, for about 10 bucks. And I'm telling you, if you're getting into this hobby, it's 10 bucks very, very well spent. You can make the holes with nails heated up on a stove or with a Dremel tool, but these are just so much easier, as you'll see here. And I'm going to go ahead and speed this up a little bit because this takes a while. But you want to do a couple rows in a normal terrestrial enclosure. I'm going to come back to that. I just purposely made a boo-boo to address that later. But it depends on the species you want. I usually try to do two rows like this here, which gives me enough ventilation and allows it to keep some of the moisture in because you don't want them to dry out too, too quickly. You could do three row, rows. There's no real science to it. It's just you kind of get used to it and do it by feel. So if you want to do three rows, do three. If you want to do them a little closer together, a little further apart, whatever. I've seen some people only put one or two holes in. I don't think that's enough. So here's the spot here where I messed it up. Basically, what you do to fix this is put a piece of tape over it. And I mention this because sometimes when you're burning them, they make the holes too big. Slings can get through very tiny holes, so you want to make sure those are covered. So here we go. I'm on the table. I've got everything set up to put some of these enclosures together, and we go over some of the more popular types. First one, most popular, easiest to get are the deli cups. You can usually get them in souffle size, like the one I just put down, or 32 ounce like we have here or the 16 ounce, which I'll show in a moment. And they're very cheap, easy to come by, easy to ventilate, stackable. One of my favorite things to use for slings for enclosures and good for slings for a quarter in, uh, three quarters of an inch or above. Here's the 16 ounce variety. Notice this one's a lot more transparent than the arboreal one. When you order them, try to find the clear ones. 
another popular choice, Amec boxes or Jamie's uh, Tarantulas does her enclosures like this. They're very easy to make your own or you can get them from her. One thing I do advise people when you get them, open them and close them a couple times because they can be very stiff to start out. So you want to open them and close them a couple times to open them up. And then they're very easy to keep open for feeding or for watering like that. You just prop it open, do what you need to do and close them back up. I like them a lot. And then we have the popular dram bottles. So you can buy these very cheaply, usually on Amazon or eBay. They come in many different sizes, as you can see here, for different size slings. You can vent them using the burn method with the soldering iron there. Or most people will just take a thumbtack or a needle, poke a bunch of holes in the top. I, I like things ventilated from the side, so I would try to put a couple holes in the side, but you got to be careful you don't make the holes too large that a tarantula can squeeze through. But these are cheap, easy to find, and have been used in the hobby for a long, long time. Now some of the other things we have here, ingredients, we're going to want our cork bark. I buy these by the pound and get little pieces, and I cut pieces off of big pieces. Always good to have these on hand. They make great hides for the tarantulas, both arboreal and terrestrial. And we have some plastic leaves here, which I get these from Petco when they're on sale on the vines, and I just rip them off the vines. You can trim them to the size you want, and they come in all different varieties. And water dishes. Do not forget your water dishes. Your slings will not drown in them. I've done a whole video on this and a blog on it. But these are bottle caps from water bottles. I advise people, if you want, to buy water bottled water bottles to water your tarantulas with. And then as you open them and use up the water, keep the caps to use as water dishes. Very cheap, and you can toss them out if they get old or dirty. And sphagnum moss. I buy this, I believe, at Home Depot or Petco. I buy the long fibered variety and I love this stuff for just holding moisture, adding hides because they can hide underneath it, um, giving them materials to build dirt curtains or hides with. They can web it all up. Great stuff and a bag well, like this runs for about six bucks and will last you forever. I think I got this one like three years ago and it's still got some left. And then finally your substrate. What I got here is a mixture of topsoil and vermiculite but cocoa fiber works great. So does peat or any mix thereof. So you don't have to use exactly what I use. I like this because it holds moisture. And remember with slings, most species of slings, if not all of them, you're going to want to have some moist substrate in there for them. Some you can just put it on the bottom layer and I'll show you how to do that in a minute. So you want to make sure you got some substrate that's going to hold the moisture a little bit and not evaporate super fast. So here we go. Start off. Another thing you want to pick up, you can get these at Walmart. I believe this was six bucks and the glue sticks were two dollars, but a little glue gun. This is the little variety. You can get the big one as well. Again, money well spent if you're going to be in this hobby because a glue gun is really, really convenient for going ahead and gluing decorations, gluing cork bark. I've taken cork bark pieces and put them together to make big pieces. Just a really important tool for this hobby. So what we're going to do here, just very, very simple. Put a little dollop of glue there. Squeeze it on in. You can also take uh, sphagnum moss after you do this and put it over the glue to kind of cover up the glue spot. I'm just doing this quickly to show how you do it. And then you press it on, being careful to not glue your thumb to it like I pretty much did here. But I was just trying to show how it's done. Usually you only have to hold it for 30 seconds or so. I go ahead and put a little dollop over top of it too to hold it down. And then right here we would have a wonderful little piece of cork bark with the accompanying plant for an arboreal species. You would do the same thing for a terrestrial species, just making sure that you take a smaller piece that's going to fit in the enclosure and you lay it down and try to make the plant stand up. So nice little decoration here, plus the um, floral part of it will give them something to web to. Now to start out, I'm going to do a terrestrial enclosure using a 16 ounce deli clep. And you'll notice the holes. I have the two rows of holes here. And I did make that boo-boo hole because I wanted to show to do this. Here I just got some clear packing tape. I'm just going to take it and put it over the hole. And you do want to check your holes before you put a tarantula in it. Go over. Make sure that it's covered up. If you have any big ones, if you have any doubt, go ahead and stick some tape over them. So what I'm going to do here, start out with the soil. Fill it up. And I see a lot of people just dump it in and leave it loose. Pack that soil down. They can dig through it. If they're small, it doesn't matter. The, uh, the fossorial species will dig through it. But pat that down nice and tight. Get it nice and packed down in there. Don't leave it fluffy. A lot of them won't even walk on if it's fluffy. And then what I like to do is, after packing down the bottom layer, spray it down real good. Wet it up. Make it wetter than the top layers. And what this will do is leave a nice wet layer on the bottom. So if the tea wants to uh, burrow, to get to its preferred moisture level it can and then I put some drier stuff on the top of it and I have had instances where I've had tarantulas that have gone ahead and burrowed straight down to the bottom to get the moist stuff and made their burrow there which is great for molting and keeping them hydrated 
So after we pack it all down, what we're gonna wanna do is add our cork bark. So I'm gonna get a little piece of cork bark here and we're gonna go ahead and stick it right in there and make a little starter burr underneath it. Now, I had another piece of cork bark and what you'll see in the top is what you should put in there, which was a larger piece of cork bark that was better uh, suited for this with plants on the top. Um, I had forgotten to put the plants on this one, so that's why that one's up there. But you're gonna make a little starter burrow in there. And usually when you put your tarantula in here, you wanna aim it right to that starter burrow. And the plant can usually either be glued on like we could have done here or should have done before, or some people will just take the plant, especially in the smaller containers where they can't fit cork bark, and just stick it in the dirt. Problem with that is the sling is eventually going to dig around it, and it's probably going to end up buried, but it will work in a pinch. So now we've got this all set up. We're going to take some pinches of sphagnum moss that laid in there. This can be moistened down to give your tea a drink. It also is another place that it can hide under when it gets in because you want the tea to feel secure. And then drop in your water dish. Push it down, fill it up. Easy. And that's a nice little terrestrial setup right there. About as simple as you get. You can see it very, very well. Gives it some space to grow. This would probably hold the tarantula until it was about eh, two inches or so, maybe a little bigger depending on the species. And you can see right there, very, very simple, basic setup. Now to do an arboreal setup, it's very, very similar. With the arboreal setup, we're going to start instead with the 32 ounce deli cup. We're going to add our dirt, pour it in, do the same thing we did with the terrestrial, pack it down and then spray it down. Moisten up those lower levels, give it a choice. It'll also raise the humidity in that enclosure a little bit. And then pour some of the more dry stuff. This stuff is still a bit damp, but not as wet as the stuff beneath it. So stack that right on top. Now some people might be thinking, why is he putting so much in there? Because if you notice, I've got a couple inches. Keep in mind, this is a good depth because many arboreal species will dig. Uh, Psalmopoas, tapis, and Pisolotheria species will all do burrowing, as will some of the other arboreals. Now I'm going to go ahead and put the sphagnum in. I'm going to put it against this side and kind of pack it up in there. This is going to give it, again, a place to hide. And I'm going to put it under the cork bark so that when they start going ahead and webbing up and making their enclosures, this gives them some materials to make their dirt curtains so they can hide. And most arboreal slings or many arboreal slings will go ahead and use that and build their little hide right behind that using that stuff to kind of give themselves some privacy. And we're going to drop in our water dish. We're going to use our sprayer to go ahead and fill it up. And this is pretty much how I fill them up too when I'm doing their housing. And I'm going to spray a little water on the side. And when I'm rehousing a new sling, a lot of times they'll come right up and start drinking off the walls. They've been traveling for a day or two. They're thirsty and this gives them a place to drink. And then notice we've got obviously this well ventilated. We've got our cork bark in there. We've got our sphagnum moss. We've got our water dish. Very, very convenient, easy hide. And then our tarantula will probably go right in there, web up, and that's where it'll take residence. So I love these enclosures, quite frankly. Um, they're very cheap to do. They look nice. They stack on a shelf. And I use these for the majority of my arboreal slings, unless they're really teeny tiny. Three quarters of an inch above, they're going in that. And then if you're doing a fossorial species, notice I've got dirt here. What you want to do is create a starter burrow for it in the corner. That way you can see where it digs. So I take a paintbrush, I jam it down there in the corner, make a little starter hole. And what happens is when the tea goes in, it'll go right in there. You can take a piece of cork bark and put it in there as well and also make a little burrow under that to give it a choice because sometimes they don't always go where you want them to. Um, that's an option. Another thing you can do is also take some sphagnum moss and go ahead and sprinkle it right around that hole or near that hole because what will happen is when the tea first gets in, it's going to be nervous, it's being rehoused, so it will tend to hide under the sphagnum moss. So if you put some around there, what it'll do is give it a place to hide and once the lights go off for the evening, you usually find that it goes down and starts digging in the side. And that'll be great because you'll be able to see it where it burrows. And you can always put a couple in there. I usually do two or three holes in each corner to give it a choice. Whichever one it doesn't use, I will use to pour water down later on to rehydrate it. So very, very convenient. So so you could do this that for a fossorial thing. You could do the same thing in a 32-ounce deli cup, and that's what I use for my larger fossorial slings. And then for the really teeny tiny slings, you're going to want to look at something this size, either one of the smaller uh, dram bottles or one of those little souffle cups. Um, again, it's the same setup. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Um, there's another, ah, there it is. This bigger souffle cup is good for smaller slings as well. I'm going to be using these later on for my Hapalopus species slings. But these are great because they're smaller. You'll be able to keep track of the sling better if they're really teeny tiny. And water dishes can be provided with a Lego or using the little plastic capsules that pills come in. Very simple to do. So here we are. Basic setups. I got a terrestrial and I have an arboreal. 
And I showed you how to go about and make it basically a uh, fossorial species as well. Very simple to set up. Anybody can do it. It doesn't take long. And the tools and equipment we got here between the glue gun and the soldering iron and the actual enclosures themselves and the cork bark, you can get it all for about 30 bucks. And very, very convenient to set up looks great on a shelf and more importantly it's an appropriate enclosure appropriate enclosure for these guys which should be paramount so there we go we have our enclosure set up now it's time to get our spiders Now, before your shipment comes, when you're making up all of your enclosures, I always try to encourage people to have a couple different sizes made up. Problem is, sometimes you buy a sling online, and the sling that you get may be a bit larger than you were expecting or a bit smaller than you were expecting. Ask anybody that's ordered online before, and they'll tell you stories about getting something in that they thought was going to be a different size than it actually was. So you want to have a couple different types of enclosures around. If it comes down to it, these can be purchased at Walmart. It's like four bucks for them and they're ideal for most sling sizes. It says they're ideal for salsa and fruit and nuts. Also ideal for little makeshift tarantula cages. So this becomes easier as you're in the hobby for longer because you'll have a bunch of these containers around. But I do encourage people even just getting into the hobby Try to have a couple things ready and made up just in case you got a different size than you expected. And have an extra cage made up just in case of freebies because that happens as well. And I've had it happen to me where I'm not prepared and freebie comes in and I have to make up a cage and scramble at the spur of the moment. All right, here we're going to do a couple rehousings just to show how it works. The first one would be a larger sling and sometimes these are shipped in those tiny deli cups or deli containers. What you want to do is carefully use, not your fingers, but some tongs and open up the paper towels over the top usually it's folded on in so you can get to the spider now I've done a lot of rehousings half of my videos on YouTube rehousings so I'm a little less cautious than I probably should be in this but I advise people they're afraid the slings gonna bolt to have an extra large container on the table with these other containers in it it'll help corral it if it gets out or do it in a bathtub and then just gently prod the spider if you work slowly most of them will come out very slowly as well every once in a while you get one that's been jostled around in transit is a little bit spooked and they'll come out like gangbusters but again that's why you do it in a bathtub or have an extra large container you can put your other container in it so it's contained but there you go this one was um, an arboreal obviously and a little avicularia and safe and sound in its new container now this here just to give everybody a heads up, I have an M. Balfouri communal, so this is why I'm putting this tiny sling into this enclosure because it was nine of them going in here. So let's just pretend like this giant enclosure is not here and this is going into a normal little sling enclosure. What I do want you guys to see is how we go about unpacking one that is sent in a vial. These can be tricky because what they do is they load the paper in and then they spray it and the paper kind of swells and it gets stuck to the inside. So what you want to do is get a good grip on it, slide the whole thing out, the whole piece of paper towel, Undo the bottom, which will usually be folded over, and then you're just going to carefully unroll it. And I always feel kind of bad for these little guys because they do take a little ride here. But very, very carefully, always keep it over the container because sometimes, again, they can go and bolt out. And if you get an instance where there's a huge piece of paper towel, you can start ripping off some of the extra. Just make sure there's no spider in there because it makes it easier to deal with. And then again, uh, just good practice. I, I know some people let the slings run right out onto their hands. If you're okay with that, fine. I'm not. I, I treat everything like it's an old world. So just carefully unravel it. And then when you see the sling, prod it on out into the enclosure. Now, again, this is a huge enclosure. If you see these guys, they just rehouse them. And they're about three and a half inches long each in a bigger enclosure now. Now, just to show this a little closer... This would be one of the ones that's in a vial. You just grab the whole thing and carefully slide the entire thing out of the vial. And then what we would do is find the edge of the paper towel that's right there and carefully unravel it. And again, care is key. These are very, very fragile slings. Now, if this here happens, and you'll notice I'm going to go ahead and pull an edge, and sometimes what happens is it starts to kind of make a cone and collapse in on itself. If this ever happens while you're unpacking a sling, stop immediately. What happens is it constricts the sling at the bottom and can crush it. So if this happens, you want to go ahead, stop what you're doing, set this down, 
and just put it right in the container and let the sling come out on its own. And if the container isn't big enough to accommodate this, then put that container in another container, a larger one, so that you can put it in there and let it come out on its own. Because if you continue to pull it out, you're likely to crush the sling. And I've done it almost myself before. It should come straight out like that, not coming out as a cone, not stretching out. Now that your tea has been housed, the next question is usually when can I feed it? I sometimes jump the gun, certain species will eat immediately. So like for Myctopus and Pisolotheria, a lot of those will eat right away. But a good rule of thumb is to wait a couple days, let it settle in, let it do some webbing before offering it prey. I've also heard some people even waiting up to a week to feed them. Uh, the choice is yours, just know if you drop one in and it's not settled, it's not going to eat, it's probably going to cower from the prey, and it usually ends up freaking out the keeper that thinks something's wrong with the tea. So at least give it a day or two to settle in before trying the first prey item. And there you have it for the first part. The second part will be done hopefully momentarily. It'll feature feeding, hydration, maintenance, molting, and temperature. So again, apologize for the long length of this video, but I'm really trying to cover these topics in depth and cover all my bases. So that's it for now. Um, second one will hopefully be up and ready pretty soon, and then I'll go ahead and put them both together for a super marathon section. Thanks for watching.